Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, crossword Bible study. It's different uh, for sure, but we're really glad to be able to keep things going and, and keep immersing ourselves in God's holy word. I can't think of anything uh, that is more productive, uh, especially during this time of uh, so many unknowns and, and so much anxiety, uh, to find our foundation in the Bible, to find our foundation and what God has revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ, those are smart things for us to do right at the moment, uh, to really lean in to the faith uh, and keep going. Let's begin with the prayer, and then we will jump into this lecture. Father, we pray especially at this time for all who are suffering, for all who are sick, for those who are alone, for those who uh, are hurting. We pray that you would be near them, that you would bless them, that you would shower them with your love, that your angels would minister to all who need your healing and your help. Help us as we study the scriptures today uh, to see what you want us to see and help, uh, help us to have uh, open minds and open our hearts uh, to receive again the news of your Son, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. All this we pray in his name. Amen. Okay, so it's Easter week. We have just celebrated the resurrection, and we are jumping into the second letter of St. Peter, just to kind of revisit where we were when we last left off. We had uh, just finished 1 Peter, and we didn't actually think we were going to get to do 2 Peter, so this is in some way a blessing to us uh, to be able to do this study. Um, we are um, right here at the beginning verses of uh, 2 Peter, and we are remembering that uh, it is Simon Peter uh, who, who wrote this book, the earliest uh leader of the Christian church right after the day of, of the ascension. Remember the apostles uh, huddled together for 10 days. 10 days later, the Holy Spirit comes and St. Peter clearly takes his role as the leader of the early church. And we read about that in the Acts of the Apostles. So he's the writer of this letter. He was with Jesus for for all that time, uh, for those three years. And, and from the very beginning, he's one of his first uh, disciples, um, and he is writing a letter uh, that's the second in this series. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, he tells us that this is the second letter he's written to this same group of people. So we have the letters, we studied it, 1 Peter and now 2 Peter. It's written to the churches in Asia Minor, um, 1 Peter tells us. Peter is uh, about to die. He says that in verse 14 here of chapter 1, that he thinks his time is short on this earth. And so he's motivated to uh, write this letter to encourage um, fellow Christians. And he wants uh, everyone to remember his teaching. So this is in some way kind of enshrining some of the teachings of uh, St. Peter here, this uh, letter, Second Peter. Now we do know that St. Peter dies during the persecution of the Emperor Nero. Uh, so, so he's probably right here that his time is short. I don't think he's writing this, you know, on the same day that he's getting executed, uh, but time is short. And so he wants to, uh, you know, kind of jot down some, uh, some key concepts. What we know uh, from uh, 2 Peter is that there's some bad teachers out there that have risen up in the life of the early church. There's some bad information floating around. And, and so what St. Peter wants to do in this letter is to correct some of the bad information uh, that's floating around. And I'll get back to that here in just a second. But that's what motivates uh, St. Peter to, to get going on this letter. Here's what he starts with, and this is really, really important stuff. Uh, he says this in verse 4, and the first really concept that he develops here in chapter 1 
is this sharing that Christian people have of the divine nature of God. Uh, so he says that through Jesus, God has invited uh, us uh, to be participants in the divine nature of God, to, to share in God's life um, and to share in God's love. Now, this concept undergirds so much of the New Testament teaching that uh, Christian people are adopted as sons and daughters of the living God, that God shares with us through Jesus uh, everything uh, that he has, all that he has is promised to his son and then promised to us also. And there is Jude with a shaved head. Jude got a buzz cut during this uh, pandemic. Oh, thanks for the hugs, buddy. And he is inviting us uh, to share in the divine life, the divine nature. Now, one of the uh, earliest uh, Christian writers, he said something uh, really important. He, uh, he said that the Son of God became man so that men could become sons of God. Now, think about that for just a minute, that you and I uh, share in God's own nature through the virtue of holy baptism and through the virtue of faith in Jesus Christ, we are uh, adopted as sons and daughters of the living God. And so we take on the divine life. And that's part of what we mean when we say that we have the hope of eternal life uh, because one of the uh, characteristics of the divine life is, is perpetuity. Uh, God is without beginning and without end. And so when you and I uh, dwell with Christ and in Christ, it's one of the reasons why we can say with some confidence uh, that we will live forever. That's not a, a concept of human nature. That's a concept of divine nature. So we dwell with, in, in God's life um, and we dwell in God's love. You and I participate in the life of God repeatedly. Uh, we do this through worship and prayer. We do it through the sacraments of the church. These are uh, touch points uh, of God's uh, life and God's love and God's divine grace. Um, there's this book that we have circulated and many of you have read by uh, Frank Wilson. It's called Faith and Practice. And he talks about uh, the sacraments of the church and the ministry of the church being uh, a way to plug in to God's divine life and love. So he says, you know, God's grace, God's divine life is, is like electricity in the air. Electricity is everywhere. There's lots of, uh, it, it's in the air around us all, at all times. It's in our bodies already. Our bodies have an electrical current. Uh, and yet, he says, we have these outlets in our homes. And if you have the right plug and you have the right outlet, you can plug into that and it becomes something really powerful and something where energy is conducted and flows through um, the, the cord to create some work. And he says, you know, he, he uses that analogy. He says, this is how the sacraments of the church are. This is how the ministry of the, of the body of Christ, this is what the body of Christ does, is it, is it channels God's energy, his divine energy, his love, and his life, and his grace, uh, and it connects it uh, to the life of the believer. And of course, that happens through the work of Jesus Christ. And let's not forget that the work of Jesus Christ, it's not uh, something that's over. It's not something that happened a long time ago, but it's something that continues in the body of Christ uh, to our own day. Then St. Peter transitions uh, uh, from that, and he says, listen, because we are partakers in the divine nature and the divine life and God's eternal love, uh, that there are some character traits that uh, that must mark our lives and that we should be striving for and that these are things that Christian people should be known for. And he has uh, several that he writes down. He says goodness and knowledge and self-control and godliness and 
endurance and mutual affection. And then he says there's one that encompasses uh, and crowns all of those other six, and he says that's love. That uh, love is the greatest of all virtues, as uh, St. Paul tells us. You know, faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. Um, and God's love for us is what we've been contemplating this last week with Holy Week and Easter. We saw... Uh, during Holy Week and Easter, that there was uh, nothing that Jesus wasn't willing to do uh, to show us how much he loves us. Uh, that we see this so clearly in the washing of the feet, and then he says to his disciples, uh, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Or at the cross, we see him stretch out his arms of love there at the cross, uh, that all of us might come within the reach of his saving embrace. God's love is what motivated those actions. It's what motivated everything uh, that Jesus did. And so these traits, goodness, knowledge, self-control, godliness, endurance, mutual affection, and love, St. Peter says, these are the things that we clearly see marked the life of Jesus, and therefore... Uh, they must mark our life as well. They sound a lot like the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, there's a lot in common here. Uh, the fruits of the Spirit are in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. And so, um, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. So these are uh, some, some overlap with those. Uh, but they're all, all of these are these sort of virtues that we see um, are great descriptions of the life Jesus lived on this earth, the life described to us in the Gospels. And St. Peter's telling us this is the type of life uh, that, should divine, uh, that should define every Christian person. So we live the divine life, and part of the way we live it is we live into these character traits, if that makes sense. Then he gets to the purpose of his letter here uh, as he transitions in verse 12. The purpose of his letter is clearly to create a memorial of his teaching. Uh, and he wants to, in this, address an accusation. So I said earlier that there's some, uh, some bad teachers out there and there's some, some skeptics out there. And what we know is that some people were saying things like, well, you know, Jesus, he wasn't really risen from the dead. They just made all this stuff up, you know, and, and uh, all these things that, that St. Peter is saying about Jesus uh, ascended into heaven, that's all made up stuff. Now, there are people, of course, in our own day that continue to say these things, but uh, people in those days were saying them as well. Uh, and so Peter wants to address that accusation. That all of this is stuff that made that was just made up. And he does this by pointing to his first-hand eyewitness account. He's saying, I was there. I saw these things. Now, this is, of course, what all of the other apostles do, and they insist that they really did see these things happen. Uh, and they insist on it even on pain of death. I mean, at the point of death, let's not forget that they do not recant their story. Uh, they don't say, yeah, you know, it all sounded good, and uh, but it really was a myth. No, they go to their death. I mean, getting, getting killed for this particular proclamation, uh, and St. Peter is no exception, right? It just within uh, some short period of time after this, uh, St. Peter will die uh, for this faith. So St. Peter wants to say, I was there. I saw these things. That's why they're reliable. I can tell you I saw them with my own eyes. And the first event he points to is the transfiguration. Uh, the transfiguration of Jesus up on the mountain. You'll remember uh, Jesus is there and uh, Moses is on one side and Elijah is on the other uh, with Jesus between them, and Jesus' garments are, are glowing white. So Jesus, uh, Peter was there, 
and he sees this and he says, and I saw his glory, the eternal glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And then he says, and if that weren't enough, what we need to know is that all scripture is, is reliable and it's inspired. And so all those Old Testament prophecies uh, that we've all been familiar with, those are things that uh, we can rely on and we can put our trust in. And, um, and they pointed to Jesus. So Peter ends chapter 1 then reflecting on how uh, Scripture is, as in his own words, completely reliable. The prophetic message is completely reliable. And what he's talking about there are all the Old Testament prophecies that, that we point that point to Jesus. And let's not forget that there's over 300 prophecies that point to Jesus, that Jesus fulfills in the Gospels. Uh, and so this is one of the things that motivates us to say that, that you can find Jesus on every page of the old scripture. This is not a, an, an opinion, he says. This is not uh, some type of strange interpretation. This is not of human origin, Peter says. This is something that God gave uh, to his people uh, in, in over the centuries. All of it was pointing to Jesus who came to fulfill all of those things. Remember that Jesus himself says that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And so that's what that whole uh, moment of the transfiguration so clearly shows us is that uh, Elijah is there, the greatest of all the prophets, and, and he himself is giving homage to, to the great, great prophet, Jesus, who is himself the eternal word of God, who, who speaks uh, and acts with the clarity of God's word. Uh, and Moses is there, Moses the lawgiver, uh, and he himself is doing homage, uh, giving homage to Jesus, uh, who is the one who is there from the very beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So it's no mistake that Peter points to the moment of transfiguration as this really important moment. He's saying, I was there, I saw it. Uh, because what he's saying is that everything that came before, all of it pointed to Jesus. And as Jesus lives his life and teaches and acts among us, that he fulfills all that has gone before. And that all of these things are reliable. That we should trust that God acted in these things. Okay. I think that will do it for this uh, uh, reflection on uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. I hope your group discussions were profitable, and I hope uh, there are some really personal questions, uh, but some powerful ones that N.T. Wright had uh, for this section. So I hope uh, that that um, was a blessing to you. Please do keep praying. Uh, for each other and know that you are being prayed for as well. We continue to pray for all the people of St. Lawrence, just like we always do uh, day by day. God bless you all.